Hi, and welcome to floss tube number 16. Yes, here we are, sweet 16. Last August, when I started this venture, I had no idea how much I was going to enjoy it and how much you were going to enjoy it also. I really appreciate that you've um, stuck with me and sent me lots of good suggestions and questions and encouragement and compliments, and I appreciate it all. When you have a second, hit that subscribe button, um, and then you will always know exactly when a new episode has been uploaded, as well as things like the, the freebie Hearts Come Home um, at Christmas um, stitch along videos um, too. So let's see, today, the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is the, the next idea for a stitch along, which is um, the Jane Hattersley sampler. And this is the one that is an antique that I purchased last summer when Salem Academy and College had a, um, an, an auction. And I'm busy learning uh, as much as I can about Jane Hattersley so I can share that information with you. So this is what I've decided ab about that. Um, I'm going to wait until actually early spring next year before we launched that as a stitch along. One of the reasons is that I'd like to give shops the time to get supplies in and perhaps do pre-orders or however they want to handle it so that we won't have the sort of crunch that we had with Hearts Come Home. Um, so I'm thinking that since April 9th is the date on her sampler, that we would honor that and use that as a start date. I don't know whether or not that's the date she finished her sampler or if that is her birth date. And that's one of the things I, I'm endeavoring to, to find out so I can sh so that I can share that information with you. But regardless, whether it's her finish date or her birth date, I thought it'd be kind of fun to use that as our start date. So we have that to look forward to. And that's the big news. Oh, actually, here is here is my, my newest news. I have decided to join the group of wonderful needlework teachers that are teaching by Zoom. Uh, I, haven't, um, I haven't done that yet. So I am kind of experimenting on my own so I can learn the ins and outs so things will go smoothly. So what I decided is that the first Zoom lesson will be um, using the hair and the basket. This is a very simple band sampler and one that includes um, a couple of really interesting stitches. One of which I'm gonna teach you actually later on um, in, in this episode today, and that's the herringbone stitch. But there are a couple of others in there as well. I in trying to reorganize my creative space, I realized I have quite a good supply of DMC flower thread, which is what I used to stitch this originally. And so I will actually be able to kit this using flower thread, which is, is, is a fun thread to use. If you haven't had any experience with it yet, I think that, that you will enjoy it. So what I need for you to do, if you are interested, is to send me an email jeanbarish at gmail.com and let me know that you are interested in getting details about the Zoom class. It would be helpful to me if in that email you would give me an idea of the days of the week and the hours of the day that would be best for you uh, for a Zoom class. If, if you don't have any specific um, time constraint, you can say that as well. But if, for example, the only day that you're available are Tuesdays from 2 in the afternoon to 5 or from 7 to 9 p.m., let me know that. And also, come to think of it, it would be helpful to know what time zone you're in as well. So once I get that information from those that are interested, I'll kind of build a, a class schedule from that. And also that'll give me time to go through and count and see how many how many kits I can make up. But my idea is that the Zoom class would be a, a, a single fee that would include the linen, the flower thread, the chart, and the instruction time all together. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about. So let me know if you're interested. 
I had an interesting comment from Karen. That's Karen with an I-N rather than an E-N. She said, do you have any suggestions for signing the finished piece with initials and the year, for example? She was talking about the um, Hearts Come Home at Christmas. She said, I did not put my initials um, or the date in the border, which, which was an option, um, but I would like to document them in the lower right-hand corner of the finished piece and a size and style to complement the design. So this is, this is what I advise people about signing their work. First of all, it's a great idea. And whether you put your full name or just your initials or whatever, I think that I think that that's great. In general, what I would do is choose a color that complements the design, but is not one of the dominant colors. You want something that's dark enough, that the tone is deep enough to be easily read on the fabric of your choice. So the color that you stitch with is going to have a lot to do with the color of the fabric. But not necessarily, you don't want it to be the first thing the eye goes to. I think that that is one of the general mistakes that I see people make. And that is, like if it's a Christmas design, they'll they'll put their initials in, in the brightest red. And, and that's okay if what you want the viewer to do is to see your initials first. If, however, what you want the viewer to do is to see the piece and for your initials to be there to document the work, then I would pick one of the more moderate colors in, in the design. And I have done everything from actually write my name on a piece of paper and then chart it out and backstitch to uh, just putting my initials, to putting Jay Farish in backstitch or whatever. One of the things I have, I've got to do soon is to create PDF files of my three alphabet books that I have published that are pretty much out of print now. And um, that would certainly give you some options. But find a backstitch alphabet that you like and and use that for your initials and, and for the date. And again, for the date, whether you put the, the month, date, and year, or just the month and the year, or just the year, all of that is personal preference. So I hope that helps a little bit with that. Another comment that I got was from Molly. And I love that she said uh, uh, about one of my um, stitch along lessons. She said, great lesson. I hope you find this humorous. I found myself moving my phone when I wanted you to move your fabric into what I considered a better view. Um, as if by moving my phone would help me see better. Now, wouldn't that be a great trick? So, and, and she is so right. When I sit down to edit these videos, I can't tell you how many times I'm like saying, oh, move over, move over, move up, move to left, move to the right. And unfortunately, most of the time, I don't, I'm not aware that I'm off camera or how far I'm off camera until I'm at the editing stage. And by that time, it's too late. I pretty much get involved in the stitching and I forget to look at the viewfinder to make sure that I'm still somewhat in the, you know, where where you at home can see it. So do forgive me for that. I, I keep wishing that I had some sort of like a little electrical vault that would, you know, alert me to the fact that I was off camera whenever it happened. But, you know, that's that's not going to happen. And I'm pretty much doing this by myself. So I don't I don't know that I'm not where you can see it or that I'm out of focus or whatever and until it's pretty much too late. So, but, but I do, I do enjoy that humor and I, I can't tell you how many times I have to like laugh at myself because I'm like clueless, it seems to what's going on. So what I want to talk about now are the three basic methods for doing cross stitch because I, I keep seeing post in various groups about people saying what is the correct way to do a cross stitch and there is no one correct way. There are three basic ways that I'm going to talk about right now and I've, I've mentioned two of the three already in, in previous episodes but even when I categorize these three there are I should say infinite. I haven't stopped and figured out. Maybe some of you that are mathematically inclined can stop and figure out how many different ways are there to make an X. 
Um, but uh, so much of it depends on what I am stitching. If I'm stitching letters like I was um, in this, this past week doing the next Hearts uh, Come Home at Christmas lesson, when I'm stitching letters, I basically stitch them as if I'm writing the letter. And so whether I start, start at the bottom or the top um, all depends on where I am with that letter. The only critical thing I would say in terms of best practices is to always make sure that the slant of your top stitch is consistent throughout the piece. So whichever way it's leaning or slanting, make sure that it all the top stitches are slanting that way throughout the piece. And uh, that's the only thing I would say that really matters. Um, of course, the number one thing that matters is that you're enjoying stitching the project. So let's talk about the Danish method, the English method, and the Victorian method. And although I have demonstrated the Victorian method before, I am going to um, demonstrate that as well right now too. Okay, so we're going to start with the Danish method, which most people think of when they think of regular cross stitch. When you're doing the Danish method, you're basically doing a row of half cross stitches working from left to right. And each stitch is going from the bottom to the top. Here, let me do it poke and pull so that's a little more clear. So I'm going from the bottom to the top. If I were stitching an Aida, I'd be stitching um, each half cross in one square. On linen, I'm doing it over two linen threads. And then when I've done whatever number of stitches are required by the design, I then finish the cross stitch by going back in the other direction. And this is what, again, people refer to as being, you know, regular cross stitch. And it is actually, when you're stitching like this, you're stitching in what needleworkers think of as being the Danish method. And whether you're poking and pulling or whether you're stitching uh, in the sewing method like this, it's still the same stitch. And on the back, what you see are upright stitches like this. And this is why so many people think of um, cross stitch. They think on the back, all your stitches need to go up and down. And that's kind of where this comes from. And that, that would be true if you were doing the whole thing in the Danish method. Um, you're not ever going to have every stitch going straight up and down in the back. You're going to have places where you are doing a series of stitches and then you're going out by one or in by one. And that's gonna give you a little, a little bit of a different look on the back. So um, I would just encourage you not to obsess with that all your stitches on the back have to be straight up and down. That, that is, that's a myth that I would very, be very happy to put that one to rest. So that's a Danish method. Let's take a look at what we refer to as the English method. I've started a second row here, and as you can see, there's no difference in the way these stitches look. The difference is the way they're executed. I'm going to start at the top and work to the bottom for my first leg, and then complete that stitch, again working top to bottom. Now, if I were working on Aida, I'd be stitching each square like this. And of course, on linen, I'm coming over two threads and um, stitching like this. The English method has a lot of advantages. It's ideal when you are working with variegated floss or any kind of an over-dyed floss. 
But one of the advantages that many people find is that if you make a mistake, and, and, and we all do, when you make a mistake, it's a lot easier to rip out and replace stitches when you are, when you have complete stitches like this. So I'm just going to do two more here and then let's take a look at what it looks like on the back. So again, I, I hope that you see that there's not um, a, a strong indication by looking at the front as far as which method has been used. So this again is what we have on the back. Again, Danish and English. Both of them are perfectly, perfectly good ways to do cross stitch. Now the Victorian method is one that I particularly like, but I find um, I like it best when I'm doing a single row as opposed to a block of color. You are again, you're doing complete stitches. This one, you're always going to be working from the right to the left. And I like it because it's a very easy one for sewing. In fact, I find it almost, I have to really concentrate if I don't do it as a sewing method. Let me, let me do demonstrate it that way though. So my first half cross is going from bottom to top and my second half cross to complete that is going from top to bottom. And then I'm moving over again on Aida, it would be one square, stitching on linen over two, I'm coming over two threads. I think I'm going to run out of thread before I get to the end of this to make three rows that are all the same length. But I think with one more stitch, I can show you on the back again how different it looks. So whether you're doing Danish or English or Victorian, they're all cross stitches and they're all great stitches to use. and. They're, they're great tools to have in your, in your tool belt. The reason I wanted to show all three of them together is for once and for all, hopefully, to put to rest the idea that there is one way to do a cross stitch. As you saw, sometimes you start top to bottom, sometimes you go bottom to top, and sometimes it's a combination of the two. So all three of them are legitimate ways of doing a cross stitch, and all of them have a kind of a... Uh, all of them can be put to use in different situations and different projects. So if if nothing else, what I'd love to do is just dispel the whole idea that there's one way to do a cross stitch because that, that just isn't true. And hopefully you will find that all three methods work for you in one situation or another. So enjoy. So I hope that that, that has helped clarify a little bit about how to do the basic cross stitch. That said, that is the most basic cross stitch. There are a lot of different cross stitches and in future episodes, I, I hope to be covering some of the different ways there are to, to, to make a cross stitch. Um, not necessarily different ways of making the basic X, but just different types of cross stitches because there isn't just the one. There are um, lots of incredible stitches that can be applied to what I like to call counted thread work. When the whole piece is all cross stitch and maybe a little bit of back stitch, we tend to call it counted cross stitch. But counted thread work is probably a better descriptor because basically you're doing a variety of stitches 
that you're using the grid of the of the linen as your guide for how you're stitching. Not all stitches are going to be over two. Not all your stitches are going to be symmetrical. And so one of the ones that I want to talk about today that's a really fun stitch is the herringbone stitch. It's one of the basic, basic embroidery stitches. It can be used for surface embroidery. It is used in needlepoint. And I love using it in my counted thread pieces as well. So I, I think that you'll find ways that you can put this to, to work. Wherever you might have a border that looks like a zigzag, this would be a, a good substitute for that. So let's take a look at how the herringbone stitch is done. Starting with a basic half cross, and from there, I'm coming over two more linen threads, and I'm gonna come down to four linen threads, and I'm gonna scoop up two linen threads. From here, up top, I'm gonna skip these two linen threads, come over two more linen threads, and scoop up these two linen threads. From there, I'm going to come down the bottom area, skip these two linen threads, scoop up the next two linen threads, and just keep going back and forth like that. Up top, I skip two, scoop up the next two, and notice that my needle is pointing to the left. And then on the bottom, I skip these two, scoop up the next two, and again, my needle is still pointing to the left. Then back up top, skip those two, scoop up the next two, needles pointing to the left. So it, it's a nice stitch. It has a nice rhythm and uh, it works up very, very quickly. So that is the basic herringbone stitch. And it's when you are ready to stop, you simply um, end it with another half cross and then you've got a nice symmetrical little herringbone stitch there. Now that's one configuration. I can also do the same stitch so that it's tall and skinny. Again, I want to start with a half cross. And this time, I'm still going to come over two more linen threads. But instead of just coming down four, I'm going to come down six. So two, three, four, five, six. And I'm still going to scoop up these two stitches excuse me, these two threads. Then I'm going to come up here. I'm still going to skip two, scoop up two, come down here, skip two, scoop up the next two. And you can see that it ends up looking a little differently, and yet it's still executed the same way. So when you take a look at um, a design that calls for a herringbone stitch, do pay attention to the way the designer has, has described it or diagrammed it because it can look very, very different depending on whether it can be wide and fat, it can be tall and skinny, it can be perfectly symmetrical. And it's just, they're all done the same way. So it's just a, a really fun and very versatile stitch. So I, I hope that you will um, practice your herringbone stitch and find ways to use it in borders. Um, it's great divider border in, um, in band samplers. I, I tend to use it probably more than any, well, I shouldn't say more than any other one stitch besides the cross stitch, but the long arm cross stitch, which I've all already shown you, and the herringbone stitch, the stem stitch. These are stitches that I, I, I love to use and I, and I hope that you will enjoy them as well. You know, whether I am teaching you something during one of our Saturday episodes or whether it's part of the stitch along, um, 
series or the which are which are free and available to, to everyone or whether they are the video lessons that go along with something like Lady Catherine's Garden or Lady Virginia's Garden. I think the thing that I try to teach throughout all of them is what I call stitch confidence. I want you to feel that you have the skill set to read a chart and read a stitch diagram and just and go for it. Don't ever apologize for being self-taught. So many people will send me messages and say, you know, I've never taken a class. I'm, I really am just, I'm just self-taught. That's probably the best way to learn is just to dive in. And when something catches your eye and you find yourself saying, hmm, I wonder how you do that. Explore it, find out how to do it and just practice. Don't feel like everything has to be a showpiece. It's fine to just have a doodle cloth and just keep practicing these various things as you come across them. So, um, you know, just develop your stitch confidence. That is the thing that I think is the most important thing that we need a workers can do. So I hope once again that you've enjoyed this time as much as I have. I, I look forward to this every week and between now and the next time we get together, I hope that you stitch happy and stay safe. I'll see you next week.